for us to come together to joyously worship you, to adore you, to praise you, to give our hearts to you. I pray for your blessing to be on this church and each person here and online. May our eyes of faith see and behold you, our ears hear and listen to you, and our minds be focused on nothing else but you. May our hearts be soft, our tender, and receptive to receiving you and the message that you have for each one of us today. Help us to show our love for you through our lives and through our love for one another. We praise you, Lord. We worship and adore you. 
And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Would you please rise as we sing?
He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent. And sit me high upon a rock. Amen. So if you have not connect, uh, filled out a Connect card, please do so if you're new. If you have been coming for a while and haven't done that yet, please do so. You can put them in the black box in the back. I would say hand them to me, but you'll find out in a second you won't be able to do that today. Uh, if you have any questions today about that, see Pastor Nathan. And my last announcement... Thank you for all your prayers, your wishes, your thoughts, your concerns. Uh, Dad was taken to the hospital on Friday, for those of you who do not know. Um, I could not detect a heartbeat, and I could not detect a blood pressure. So I called 911, and the EMTs could not either. So he was rushed to the hospital. He is stable. He is home, he's resting, and the beauty of all this, God is so good. He is great because we have no idea what happened. All the tests came back negative. So whatever happened, 
We're chalking it up to God's miracle. So when we say God is great, he really is. So thank you for your prayers. Continue praying. Uh, he will be wearing a heart monitor for 30 days. And we'll go from there. But in the meantime, I am going to leave. And uh, I will see you next time I see you. God bless you all. God bless you. God bless you. Morning, guys. Usually this is where there's a kid spot. And I'm like, holy cow, like, how inappropriate would it be to have, like, a quirky, crazy kid spot right now, like, after all this, like, great worship and this news about Donna is just incredible, right? And so, like, I thought, like, thinking this week, it's really kind of cool how it worked out. Like, one time ago, we used to have, like, special music, which was, like, really cool. Someone would come up and just do some special music. So I thought, you know, it would be really fitting if I just did a little special music for you guys right now with my horn. Okay, here we go. <laughs> okay, wait, no, it's gonna be, okay, okay I got it. <laughs> no, it's, this, is a, this is the better part. <laughs> Together we will pray the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in all that is visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father for all worlds, God of God, light of light, true God of begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Virgin Mary, Holy Spirit, and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and on the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father through the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy, universal, and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen. Let's join together and worship our Lord.
today comes from the book of Acts, chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. One day Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and a man lame from birth was being carried in. People would lay him daily at the gate of the temple called the Beautiful Gate, so that he could ask for alms from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked them for alms. Peter looked intently at him, as did John, and he said, Look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver or gold, but what I have I give you. 
in the name of, Christ, of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who used to sit and ask for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's Portico, utterly astonished. The word of the Lord. Praise be to God. Or Thanks be to God. Let's try that again. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. We will get that right. I'll get it right one of these days. Uh, let's pray real quick. God, our Father in heaven, thank you for gathering us here together this morning. May this be a place where uh, your Holy Spirit weighs heavy on us, where we can get a true vision of Christ, where we can be born again this morning. Where we can taste your true presence, your true love. Lord, give me your words to speak. Holy Spirit, speak through me. Enlighten us and illuminate us through your word. We ask all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we're continuing through up until, in Lent we'll start a new series. But we're continuing our series on what we're kind of calling Back to the Basics. And last week we talked about what it mean, means, uh, what, what, what we are in relation to God. And we talked about this concept called Logi. Do you all remember that from last week? It's very confusing. But a quick recap. Logi, according to some of the church fathers, it's similar to the word logos. And it is the part of us that is connected to Jesus. It's the part of us that when God thought of us, he thought this idea, this beautiful, perfect, amazing version of you, and that it came through the word of God, as, first, as John 1 says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and everything was made through the word. And so our logi is the part of us that is connected to Jesus, but it's also the perfect version of us that God is calling us to become. And last week we talked about how we need to see ourselves in seeking the Lord and how we need to get a vision of our own logi, our own, uh, the own uh, kind of personal vision of what God wants to transform us into. That in this life, and a, you know, a wonderful Wesleyan idea, this idea of striving towards perfection. John Wesley, it was really, really important that in this life, through our holiness and through our service of the Lord, we are made into perfect beings. These are like so similar in ideas that you would think he would have known the people who wrote about this, but he didn't. But it just shows uh, just how amazing God is, that he has this perfect vision for us, that he wants us to see, that he wants us to to become vulnerable with them, and he wants us to be transformed into. However, the Logi is not limited to us. We are called to just focus on ourselves all the time and just see what God wants us to be made into and just try to become that. Everyone and everything has their own Logi. I have a Logi, you have a Logi. Every person here has a perfect version of yourself, a perfect version that comes directly from the mind of God. It's like our eyes. You know what they say, our eyes, there's no two eyes that are perfectly the same. It's like a fingerprint, but like somehow even more complex. Have you ever seen like close-up pictures of like people's eyes? If you haven't, there's some beautiful photography out there, and it's just amazing. Like, it's like a little universe just in our eyes, and it's full of color, and it's full of shape, and it's just this gorgeous thing, and everyone has their own unique eye. And in the same way, each of us has our own unique uh, person 
that God wants us to become. And so today, in understanding ourselves, we have to, one way we learn to understand ourselves is learning to properly love others. And so I keep saying that every week I'm going to ask a question. I'm going to try and not trip over that and ruin everything and make that the tech team, the tech team's lives I make hard enough as it is. God bless. Let's give a, a clap for Jackie and Chris and everyone, everyone who does that. Because every week guys come in and I'm like, we're doing this. And they're like, uh-oh. Um, so thank you for that. I'll try not to ruin everything again. Anyways, every week I've been saying I'm going to ask a question that I can't answer, but will hopefully get us thinking. And that is, the question is, how do we properly love another? How do we properly love another? And essentially, and I'm sorry for those of you who were there here last week as well, it's going to be very similar to last week's message, but a little different. To love another person is to see their Lohi. Just as we're called to look for our own Lohi in God and to try to become that and be transformed into that, how we begin to love one another is by seeing the perfect version that God has planned for someone in them. Before we even do anything, before we even begin the process of loving them, we first have to see them. Truly see them. You know, there's a difference between seeing somebody and seeing somebody, right? You walk down the street and you see a hundred people every few minutes. But when was the last time you really looked at them and saw them? You wondered who they are, what their name is, what their story is, what God is doing in them, what God has done in them. What God wants for them. Their pains, their hurts, their heartaches, their victories, their defeats. <coughs> Sorry about that. And so how we learn to love people begins with learning how to see them. The same way that we grow closer to God and we learn who we are is through seeing ourselves through God's eyes. We learn to love another when we begin to see them through God's eyes as well. Not just through his eyes, but through his plan. To see another person's logi is not to see them as they are. To not see them for their sins, their imperfections, or even necessarily their quirks and their likable traits. It is to see them the way God made them to be and is creating them into. To love another person and to see their Lodi is you see them for their total potentiality and loving them as that potential. As their complete and total Lodi. Our goal and the way we love people, like truly love people, is to see them for the way they will be in new creation. Not for the way they are in their current fallen state. Rowan Williams, a, uh, an amazing, brilliant church scholar, uh, Anglican priest, and he used to be the Bishop of Canterbury, not that we're Anglican, but he's absolutely brilliant. And he wrote once about Logi, and the person who really had the, 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 the ancient Christian theologian who had the most to say about Logi, Maximus the Confessor, we talked about him last week. But Williams, I believe, has the most brilliant, simple, and beautiful understanding of Logi and loving others. And this is what he has to say, I quote, Love must be grounded in the recognition that all things are what they are by nature and virtue of their participation in the Logos. Nothing can take away their entitlement to love because they are capable of growing through the exercise of their proper desire towards their destiny. 
Let me say that again to maybe a little bit plainer speak. We are called to love people as God created them to be. Not because they're there, not because they're the most lovable people, but because they have the potential to grow into what God made them to be. And by divine right of that ability, we are called to serve them and love them in a way that will lead them and treat them as if they already have that value. Because they can be redeemed, we must love them as if they're already on that trajectory. This is the quietest this room has ever been. Because they can be redeemed, we must love them as if they are on that trajectory. Now, all of us in here, I'm sure... Know somebody in their life that is like, Lord, I don't know how this person's going to be saved. Because they are just selfish and obnoxious and they hurt people, they hurt me, and I can't forgive them. And I just don't know what to do in this situation. And sometimes it just feels like people are just beyond reach. They're just beyond the ability to be redeemed, to be restored, and to grow. And when we see people in that way, we treat them that way. When we look at people and we see a condemned person, we're going to treat them as if they are condemned. But the thing is, last time I checked, we are not the ones who are in charge of making people's lives into what the next life is going to be. We are called to be witnesses. We are called to be ambassadors of the divine love of Jesus Christ. Who saw us, who saw our Logi, our potential, our potential to be redeemed. And he says, I am not going to love you for the sin that you are in now. I'm not going to love you for the brokenness that you are in now. I am not going to love you for the things you have done, but I will love you for the things that I am going to do in you. Christ loves us, not for where we are now, but where he is going to have us be. And to imitate Christ is to love the same way he loves in that way. We are called to see the logi of people by seeing the part of them that is connected to Christ. The part of them that is the divine image bearer of the sacred. We don't just see their potential, but we see them as part of the part of them that bears that true image. The part of them that is from, in, and by God. That adds another layer to this. We don't just see people for what they can be. We see them for the bit of divinity that God created us into already. The life that God breathed into some dust. And let me tell you, it's easy to see people as dust. It is easy to see people as dust. It is hard to see people as the divine breath. And that is what we are called to. And this is why it's so important, by the way, to really understand who Jesus is, who God the Father is, and who the Holy Spirit is. Because if we don't understand who God is, if God is just some like old man in the sky, some distant sky God who dropped a book a couple thousand years ago and then kind of left us alone ever since, if God is distant from us, if we don't know the, the traits the attributes, the character, and the virtue of God, we're not going to be able to see it in another person. And so our ability to love, to properly love another, by seeing them the way we are called to, begins with first having a proper knowledge of God himself. Because if we know God, if we know God's character, if we know how God has treated us, 
in all the paradoxes, in all the seeming contradictions, in all the uncertainties, then we can see when other people act as God created us. And so we must know God. We must know Jesus. And this is part of why, mind you, we've talked before about, actually a few weeks ago, maybe a month ago, we talked about how we are, what it means to be made in the image of God, and that we are God's idol, that we are kind of the divine representatives. That's what it means to be God, made in God's image, that we are his divine representative here on earth. And what we do to each other, we do unto God. And this Logi, this connection to God, this divine Logos that is already weaved into the fabric of our DNA, this is why Jesus tells us that when we help those in need, we are helping him. It's not just a nice metaphor. When Jesus says, when Jesus says, when you feed those who are hungry, when you give thirst to those who ask, when you clothe those who are naked, you do this unto me. He means the exact same thing as when he takes the bread and says, this is my body. I may get in trouble for saying that. But you look at the words and there's no difference. Jesus says, this is my body, remember me. And he says, when you love them, that's me. So when we see Christ in the other, we are actually connecting with God. The same way that when we see the bread and wine as the living presence of God entering us, we are connecting with God. And so our love for another has to be grounded in knowing and understanding God. And knowing, and this is why we can't just go out and just be good people and then do this and then it's the same thing. Like we, we oftentimes accidentally make this mistake where we have like our spiritual life over here and we have our service life over here. And we think our service life is just go and be nice. Go and love people. Go and do good works and go and do good things. And then we think our spiritual life is we worship God here. This is where we see God. And over here we submit and we are saved by faith, but over here, it's all about our ability to serve and help. But the reality is, is these two things are not supposed to be separate. We are supposed to see and connect with God in our loving of people just as much as in our worship in this building. Just as much when we are in our quiet places at home in prayer. Just as much as we are reading scripture, we are called to see the presence of God in loving another. And this is why we can't just go out on our own and try to be good people. Because we will never be able to love as Christ loves if we are not seeing Christ in the process of loving. And so we must understand that to see people, to see another, to love them by seeing that divine potential, the logos weaved into their bodies, is to worship. It's to worship God. God is within us. We are made in his image. And so when we are love, when we are loving, we're not just loving another person. We are loving the temple of Christ. Whether or not they're born again, whether or not they're saved, whether or not they're good, whether or not they're bad, whether or not they're even from a different religion, they were made to be temples, right? They were made designed, no matter how low they go, they were designed for one thing and one thing only, and that was to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. Um, if our church 
gets really bad and there's only like three of us in here and we're not doing a good job of following down, do we take it out on the building? No. We don't burn the building down. We don't throw rocks at it. We don't shake our fists at the building. What do we do? We say, you know what? It's time to do the work and make this place into a place filled with the Holy Spirit. Amen, Amen. Amen indeed. And so when we see others out there, when we see those who are not easy to love, who are not Christians, who in fact we may call our enemy, our goal is not to just distance ourselves and point fingers and blame. Our goal is to say, how can I bring the Holy Spirit into them? How can I treat them as a temple of the Most High? How can I see that they are designed to abide in Christ and all that is necessary is for them to take that step over the line? Everyone in this world is one step from being filled with the Holy Spirit. And do we see that when we see people? Do we see that when we look at our neighbor, our coworker, that you know what who cut us off in traffic? <laughs> Are we seeing someone who's one step from embracing their loading, from being on that trajectory towards perfection? <coughs> Are we seeing them? And this brings us to our scripture, Acts 3. I love this passage. I read it this week in my own personal devotions and I forgot about it, but I always have loved this. Peter and John, this is right after, you know, the day of Pentecost has happened, the first like movement of the church in the Holy Spirit, they were speaking in tongues, and now they've started to do the day-to-day -day work and they're going every day to the temple and they are entering through this gate called the beautiful gate and there is a common sight for that day. And a common sight for anyone if we went to downtown Chicago. And there is an individual who is begging. Who actually had to be carried there by his friends. And what great friends will carry you there and then we'll just leave you and we'll catch you later. But at least, you know, they got him there. And he's just sitting there, not even making eye contact. He knows he is so invisible. He knows he is so invisible that he just by rote says the words. Amen. Amen. That's right. I love having kids in the room. It always makes me sad when there's Sunday school during church. right. Amen. So just imagine, he knew he was so invisible. He would just say the words, can I have some money? Can I have some money? Wouldn't even look at them. So unseen. So unseen. But what does Peter do? When Peter sees him, he doesn't just throw some money, he doesn't just walk by, and he doesn't even just talk at him. Because he could have just begun <coughs> talking at him, and just talking to him, but he doesn't do that. He does something very different. He sets up the conversation that's about to take place. And as he set it up, he says, look at me. He says, look at me. And what does the scripture say? He said he fixed his attention on him, expecting to receive something. What does that tell us? It tells us that he's not used to being seen. It tells us that this is a man who has never had that personal connection with a stranger. Now what does he do when, you know, someone nice actually looks at them for a second? He thinks that they're going to be generous. 
And they are. They're about to be the most generous they can ever be. But he expects a worldly generous. And he looks at them and he sees that they are intently looking at them. If you have a Bible and it's in that translation, underline that word intently. Once again, you can look at someone and you can look at someone. When John and Peter were looking at this man, when they were looking at this crippled beggar, they were not just seeing another poor person begging for money. They weren't just seeing another person who had a rough life. They weren't just seeing another man who was both spiritually and, in his case, physically broken. But they saw his potential. They looked at him intently, and they saw what Christ had in store for them. He saw a glimpse of the Logi and was empowered to heal him towards that. When we see people's true potential, when we see them as divine image bearers, when we see the part of them that is one step away from being a full temple, not just a temple, but a full temple, we are going to feel empowered to bring healing to their lives. We can't just heal people. We have to see them first. The story in Genesis, I love it, of, of Hagar and Ishmael, and God promises to bless her in the desert, and she calls him the God who sees me. Are we going to be known as the people who see? The people who see God, not just in our worship, not just in our prayers, not just in our scripture, but in one another and love them and treat them and value them in that. Because the goal of this life, this goal of following Jesus is not just to follow because he told us to. The prophets promised that we will have a law that is inscribed on our hearts. That doesn't mean we just know what to do because we know the Lord. What it means is we don't have to be told what to do because we are so empowered by the Holy Spirit, we're going to want to do it anyways. Where we don't have to be reminded to love our enemies because we're going to want to love our enemies. Where we're not going to have to be reminded to see their potential, to see their redeemed self, to see their telos, the end goal, the finish line. We just see it, and we want it. The, I don't know what was happening in Peter's mind, but it doesn't say, and then the Holy Spirit turned to Peter and said, look at the man and heal him. All it says is that, that he looked at him intently, and he said, I'm going to give you something better than silver and gold. And in the name of Jesus in Nazareth, stand up and walk. Amen, indeed. He was compelled out of seeing the potential to love him and heal him. Peter offers us the perfect example of what it means to desire the fruition of another's logi. And that is like my thesis for this and my question. Do you desire their logi? Not just desire that they stop sinning, not just desire that they treat you better, not just desire that your relationship with them is better, but do you desire their perfected self and love them for that? And I love his response, leaping and praising. When people are loved, for the potential that Christ has in them, the end result is leaping and praising. We need to become people who say, look at me. And we need to become people who look intently. 
We don't have to do it with everyone at first. Start with your families. Start with your neighbors. Let me tell you, we would start a revolution if we just learned how to look intently at our next door neighbors. We don't have to go save the world. We don't have to go into the center of Cook County and, you know, bring about a revival there. We can bring about a revival in our driveways, in our dining rooms, in front of our mailboxes. And all it takes is to see. All it takes is to have the divine imagination to see what the Spirit can do and want it. Not just do it, but want it. So how do we see this? How do we see this? God created every person out of love for a reason and to be something. God, believe it or not, no matter how much it feels like it, didn't create us, everyone, just to be a person or just to be a jerk or a sinner or another warm body taking up space. Each and every person has something God desires them to be. And it is good, and it is beautiful, and it is filled with love. We must stop and think, something we are not always all that disciplined about. But we must stop and think and say, what good, loving, beautiful thing is God working for them to become? See it. And love that for the wonderful, good, and beautiful thing that it is. Even if you never see them reap the harvest of that perfection, they will reap a harvest of God's love, regardless of it, whether or not they respond. We're not called to necessarily be reapers. We're called to be investors. Investors in the lives of others. To be planters. We plant. God fertilizes and waters. And then when he says it's time, someone will harvest. This seeing them, this seeing them and desiring for them, that is planting the seed. If we want to know how to see someone lowly, we need to look nowhere else than Jesus. Look nowhere else at what Jesus does. This, uh, to plug Sunday school, we're going to be talking about what it means to imitate Christ and how the early church understood what that meant. And so we'll see that as like an appendix to today's sermon. But just look to Christ. Christ lowered himself down and out of love to meet us where we are at so that we might live alive. Christ came down. He poured himself out, as scriptures say. He poured himself out so that we might become alive. Christ lowered himself so that we might be lifted up into our logi. And having him dwell within us makes us able to strive towards that goal of perfection. And so we must do the same. We must lower ourselves, not to just those we see as less than, but meet people exactly where they are, not where we would have them be, so that we can then see them for what God would have them be and love them as that. Let me say that line again, because this is where we mess up. We must see people not for where we would have them be, but for where God would have them be. There's a big difference. The reason why we fail to love is because we see people for what we want them to be. Our problems at loving isn't that there's not enough opportunity. It's not that we don't know what to do. It's that we don't have the right vision. Our goal is not to just become better people. It's to have the eyes to see and the ears to hear.
And when we can see, when we can imitate Christ and see them as God would want them to be, and we love them in a manner which helps allow them to become that which God is calling them to be. There are so many roadblocks when it comes to loving. And there are so many roadblocks between where we are and what God desires us to become. Sometimes what, that ro what removes that roadblock is just someone loving us because they see what we were created to be. That's what Jesus' motivation was. That's what Peter and John's motivation were in talking to that beggar. They didn't just want another example of a healing. There were plenty of healings. It wasn't for spectacle. It was because they loved him. Christ did not see us for the death and sin and disease and toxicity that we have become, the plague of humanity that we often are. But he saw us for the good things we can be. And Christ removed the roadblocks for us. Let me tell you, what saved me, what saved me was not a good sermon. What saved me was not a good worship song. What saved me was not a beautiful church. What saved me was that when I was at my most unlovable, there were a few men in my life that said, I still love you. Even when I didn't love myself. In fact, it was so profound and powerful, I have a tattoo dedicated just to those men in my life who loved me when I was my most unlovable, when I was my most broken, when I was the farthest away from God I could possibly be, these men came to me. And they said, I don't see you for the way that you think you are. I don't see you the way the world sees you. But I see you the way Christ sees you. Now join me. And let me tell you, it saved me. Not just saved me from some hot place after this life, but saved me in this life. Saved me from myself. Saved me from my own destruction. Saved me from my own corruption into nothingness. And that is how we pull people up. That is how we make people alive. Loving them because we are in love with their logi, their potential. And we want to support, care, and serve, and do whatever it takes to get them there. Not because we think their sin is bad and we want them to stop sinning. Not because we want to save their souls. But because we see what God wants to do with them, for them, and in them. And we love them so much that we cannot live without them becoming that. We cannot live without the beauty we see in their potential, even if they never get close to it in this life. To love people is to fall in love with them, to fall in love with them as the creature that God fell in love with and why he created them. Annie, you can come up. None of us in this room would be saved if God did not have vision for us. None of us in here would be saved if God did not see what he wants us to be. Here is what I call all of us in here. Have vision. Look around for a second. Look at each other. And see them. Mm -hmm. Imagine. Imagine what God has created each and every one of you for. Imagine the beauty of what that perfect creation can be. Imagine for the love that God can have in them. 
the beautiful works of the Spirit that can be filled with them. Imagine what it looks like to lift them up. And then let us extend this to the world. Let us have Christ's vision, and, and as he sees us, let us see those around us. Let us share this vision for one another. We're going to worship now. And I want us all to ask God for the vision of Christ when we go out in the world this week. To see Christ in each other. To see Christ in your neighbor, in your coworker, that person you pretend to not hate. We all got those people. And let us stop and look intently. Let us stop and see that Christ is in them. that when we love another, we are joining in in the love of God. And that not only will we know Christ more, but we will have the wonderful privilege of bringing this kingdom and having them know Christ. Not because they're lovely and perfect, but because they're not. And they were loved and adored in. Let us stand. Let us stand and worship the Lord. Let us sing to our God.